If you will, stand for the reading of the word. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were Gentiles carried away by those to those dumb idols, however you were led, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are differences of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. May God add his blessing reading the word. You may be seated. I want to point out a couple of things to you. Number one is, in your text, you probably have noticed that the word gifts in 1 Corinthians verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1, is italicized. And the reason that it's italicized in your Bible is because it was added by the interpreters, presumably for clarity. But what Paul actually said then, so he, and so he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, comma, brethren, comma, I do not want you to be ignorant. But this is what Paul actually said. He said, concerning spiritual brethren, comma, concerning spiritual brethren, comma, no gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. What Paul is trying to say is, is I want you to understand the spiritual man and the spiritual woman in your midst, they do some strange things sometimes. And sometimes it might freak you out just a little bit. But they are messengers of the power and with the anointing of the Holy Ghost that God has sent into your situation. Let them do what God has sent them to do and you'll see a breakthrough. This is what he's trying to, to clarify here. He talks about the gifts. So this whole chapter is known as the gifts chapter and he talks a lot about the gifts and I wanna talk about that also. I wanna teach on those. But Paul's number one, number one concern for the church of Jesus Christ is that they would become ignorant about spiritual men and women. Say, I'm a spiritual man. When you are a spiritual man, then you are, you, are, you are led by, and one of the things that manifest in your life are these spiritual gifts. Charismatic church, the charismatic church, the word, the Greek word for gift is charisma. C-H-A-R-I-S-I-S-M-A. The plural of that is charismata. So the charisma, the spiritual gifts, the charisma of God come from a Greek word of grace, which is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. So the gifts, therefore, according to the language syntax, the gifts of the Spirit are gifts and manifestations of God's grace. And so, so grace being what? More than forgiveness, right? Have you ever heard that here in this church? Grace is more than mere forgiveness. It's a non-physical force. Say the force be with you. It's a non-physical force that emanates from beyond you, from the throne of God up in the third heaven. It emanates through the universe like a beacon, like a radio wave, like an, like a, like a like an x-ray, it, it penetrates and goes through everything. It, it, nothing, matter cannot stop the force called grace. And if you become receptive to grace, how do you become receptive to grace? It's by grace through faith. Faith is the conductor of grace. So when you become receptive to grace, because you have built a faith and a confidence in the word and you have pursued this spiritual life and desire to become a charismatic, a Christian who is spiritual in his very nature, who hears God, who speaks for God, who is obedient to the Holy Spirit, to the will of God. When you get into that and you develop that faith, you have that ability to tap into this force in nature called grace that can do for you and in you what you can't do on your own. And let me tell you how great this strategy of grace is 
This strategy of grace is so good that when Paul cried out to God, God said in, about his affliction, God said to him, my grace is sufficient. It works every time. It's all you need. Are you in a drought? Rely on that. Tap into that signal, that beacon signal from the throne room of God. Are you, are you, are you, are, do you need healing in your body? Do you have a tumor in your body? Call out. Reach out. Tap into that beacon, that, that force that's emanating through the universe and declare healing into your body by the Spirit. But I'm telling you, you have got to get past the idea that grace is just being forgiven. Yes, it's being forgiven. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's an important part of grace. But it's so much more than that. It's the very power of God coursing through the universe like a river. And you can drink from that thing just like Elijah called down, just like Gay came up here and got in a community of faith and people begin to believe, not judge, they begin to believe. We knew she'd been off chasing rabbits. We didn't care. She was home. This is her home right here. This is her spiritual place. This is the place where she comes and connects to that beacon. And she surrounds herself with other believers, brothers and sisters, that have developed that capacity of faith to tap into that power. And she comes up here, and first thing she does is apologize, and we said, we don't want to hear none about that. What's your problem? Because we just love you and God loves you, and we want to release this grace into your circumstance. <coughs> Listen, if you know anything about insurance companies, you know it takes a miracle to get anything out of one. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. So I just want you to understand that what we're talking about here is the grace that courses through the veins of a spiritual man and how it manifests in their life. There are nine specific ways that Paul talks about here. So, <clears throat> he was overly concerned with the fact that the church of Jesus Christ may become ignorant to how a spiritual man operates. And that's why he decided to teach on the spiritual gifts. So, Paul introduces you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, he introduces you to three important guiding principles that distinguish the ways of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Brother Kemp said, it's not enough to know the Word of God, you have to know the ways of God, okay? There are three ways that the Holy Spirit works that he always honors and stays within the confines of these three principles. Number one, the principle of conscious control. Let me read the scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, 2 and 3. For you know that you, when you were Gentiles, that you were Gentiles, and you were carried away by these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make it known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one says that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This was in Corinth. Corinth was a major seaport in Greece. It was a, it was a bastion of the worship of Aphrodite. She was a... A, a sexual goddess and they had this huge temple built and and they had temple prostitutes and the whole thing and so they would go up there and they would get you know they would do whatever they do but they would get into these states of altered consciousness and uh, and god knows what all they did I'll let your mind go wherever it needs to go but and he said you this is not being under the influence of the holy spirit is not like that being under the influence of the Holy Spirit never dishonors that conscious uh, condition that you have. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. See, this is the thing I cannot get people to understand. God doesn't want to knock you out and make you bark like a dog. That's just ridiculous. What he wants is, is for your spiritual nature to eventually develop to the point to where it becomes your spiritual nature. Remember the three in one, the parts of the person? God is three in one. Isn't he three in one? Called the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Two one to be many, too many to be one. And we're three in one. We, we have that same characteristic. Too many, to be, too many parts to be separate, but, but too many parts to be one single part. We have body, soul, and spirit. Those are the three aspects of who we are, of our existence. And what happened in the garden was is whenever Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, his soulish nature swallowed up his spiritual nature. No longer was he a spiritual man led by the Spirit. 
And so Jesus come, and he's come so that you might have Zoe life. He came to bring you the Zoe life. I'm the way and the truth and the Zoe. That's the spiritual life. That's the Greek word for the spiritual life. So he came to save you and to revive that spiritual nature that is, was dormant inside of you. And to make it, and to help you enter the process of becoming a follower and an apprentice and a disciple of Jesus who would be someone who is spiritually dominant, who hears God's voice, who can tap into that beacon and coursing through the universe of God's grace, who has that capacity to facilitate God's will in extraordinary ways. Have I lost you? It's not about you being stupid, and it's not about you being being under the under the influence of some it's it's a, there there will always be conscious control it's about the mind making a decision to yield to the spirit and i have a lot of people that i love who love jesus and they come to me a lot and they say i can't pray in tongues i just don't get it i can't get it you are getting it but what you haven't developed is the capacity to have enough confidence for your mind to hear the word and say the word when your mind always wants to understand it and this is the problem the mind you don't be stupid to be a christian but the mind has got to decide it will do what god says to do even when it makes no sense because if you always are led by, by, around by your reasoning, you will never do the miraculous. Can I get a witness out of somebody? If you're going to be led by reasoning, you're never going to do the unreasonable. So it's a very basic thing. If you can say a word that your mind hears, but your mind doesn't understand, then you are speaking in spiritual language. It's the greatest and most basic of all the exercises of the spiritual nature. And nothing gets bashed in the church of Jesus Christ in the West like speaking in tongues. It's essential that you learn how your mind and your spirit interact. It's not about you being in a mindless trance. It's about you saying and doing the things that the spirit is leading you to do. So, Something happens, you know, in the three and one portions of God. We have the we have the, the mind, will, and they have we have the mind, the body, and the soul. In the soul, we have three 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 components of the soul, which is the mind, will, and the emotions. That's who you are. It's your personality. It's the deep seat. The soul is a deep seat of who God created you to be. There's something happens in a spiritual encounter where you become fully immersed in the Holy Spirit. Something happens and the will migrates from under the auspices and under the influence of the emotion and the reasoning of the mind and it migrates under the auspices and direction of the spirit. Now, it's not your will, it's his will. Now, your will does what it wants to do, what the spirit says to do, even when the mind doesn't understand it. That's how you tell if you become a spiritual man or a spiritual woman, you respond to the spirit. It's become your dominant nature. Number one, the principle of conscious control. You're not mindless. The mind has just chosen to submit to the spirit. Number two, the principle of glorification of Jesus. All manifestations will harmonize with the teachings and personality of Christ. God will not ask you to do anything that doesn't bring glory to Jesus. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Number three, the principle of creedal faith. The main work of the Holy Spirit is to bring people under the lordship of Jesus, not to impress them with tricks. The main purpose is, is, is for you to speak a prophetic word to someone that causes them to come to Christ and trust him and give their life to him. And the gifts are given to willing people and they're to be used to strengthen the body of Christ. This is what the gifts are for, is to strengthen the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 said, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. We're to desire the gifts, and that goes hand in hand with our pursuit of love. If I see Lonnie hurting, and I love Lonnie, she's a daughter, a spiritual daughter to me, and I see her hurting, about the worst thing I can do is go up and give her my personal advice. But if I will go before the Lord and get on my knees and say, give me a word for Lonnie. Come on. And he does. And I go to her and the Lord says, Lonnie, 
not by power nor by might, but by my spirit. You're going to become through. And I give her the word that, Lord, it strengthens her. So my motivation for pursuing the spiritual gifts is the love for the church and the love for the people in the church. The gifts are to strengthen the church, not bring division. The gifts are to strengthen the church, not bring division. Amen? You want to hear about the three classifications of the charismata? There are three classifications of the nine gifts. Revelation gifts, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. The power gifts, faith, healing, and working of miracles. The vocal gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. So the aspects of God that's revealed in each one of these sets of gifts, in the revelation gifts, you gain the eyes of God. In the revelation gifts, you see people the way he sees them. And man, is that different from the way you see them. Can I get a witness out of somebody? You see people for the way God sees them. You have that same passion and compassion for them. You see them from his perspective. The power gifts. This is the hands of God moving in a circumstance. You're the eyes of God in the revelation gifts. You're the hands of God in the power gifts. And the vocal gifts is the mouth of God. You hear God speak. You say what God says. It changes and heals their life. So I want to touch on all of these nine gifts briefly. I want to start with the revelation gifts. Number one is the word of knowledge. Usually it has to do with a present struggle or past struggle that someone is going in. And it's usually a word of knowledge. The Lord gives me a word of knowledge. When I go to other places and they come forward for ministry, God always gives me prophetic words for people that I've never met. But he always starts out with a word of knowledge. I know that you've been in a struggle. And, and, he was, and they know that I don't know them. And when I describe the struggle to them, what does that do? That validates the prophetic word that God is about to give them. I'm not there to judge them. I'm not there to say, you know, you, you, you've been struggling with addiction and all of that. That's not what I'm there to do. I'm not there to condemn. I'm there to validate that I'm hearing from God so they can receive the prophetic word that's coming. Let me give you a, an example. Jesus went to the woman at the well in John chapter 4 and she was there to get water, and he was there to dip me up some water, and, and, and he was here having a conversation with her, and he said, go call your husband. Have your husband come. Not my thing on. And he, she says, I don't have a husband. And he said, you speak rightly, because not only do you not have a husband, you've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. But for, listen to me, church. He didn't do that to condemn her. You miss this. You miss this if you're not careful. He didn't do that to condemn her. What he said is there's something insatiable in you that you cannot satisfy, and you're trying to do it with men, and it's destroying your life. But if you drink of this water, you drink of living water, you'll never experience thirst. You'll be confident in who you are. It will heal you from the inside. And that was the prophetic part. The word of knowledge was about her past so that she could be sure that Jesus was the one who he said he was. And then he said, you drink of living water. That was the prophetic. If you will accept this water I'm about to offer you, if you will do it, it will change your life. So you see the difference between the prophetic and a word of knowledge. Knowledge is about the present or the immediate past. We don't condemn people with their past. We only use a word of knowledge to reassure them of the validity of the revelation of the prophetic word that we're about to release in their life. Number two, the word of wisdom. It has to do with the future. It differs from prophecy in that it's brief and it's usually about a large situation that affects a lot of people. Just so they will understand that you're in tune with what God is doing. First Kings 18, 41, Roger alluded to it. Elijah said to Abraham, you better go and eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain, and there was not a cloud in the sky. There was no evidence of it, but he was giving him a word of, of wisdom, telling him that the condition is about to change, and so that whatever God's hope was, that whenever he gave them the prophetic word that would come after that, they would respond and repent, which they didn't. But the word of knowledge has to do with a shift. There's about to be a change in a circumstance. I mean, a, a, a word of wisdom, I'm sorry. Another example is in 2 Kings 7.1. 
Elijah said, hear the word of the Lord. So thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, he, they're, 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 they're trapped and they're under siege in Samaria and the Assyrians, I think it is, are all around them and, and, and their people are dying of starvation. And he tells the captain of the gate, tomorrow about this time a sea of flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. There's about to be an abundance of food. And the captain says to him, if God, look, if the Lord would even open the windows of heaven, how could this thing be true? And then he says something prophetic. Now he made a word of wisdom statement about a future shift in the circumstance and now he says something personal and prophetic. When you think of prophecy, think of personal. And he says it to the captain. He says, you'll see it, but you won't eat of it. Why? Because of his lack of faith in the word of the prophet. And so what happened? You know, the lepers, they were thrown out, and they went out to the Syrians' camp and said, hey, maybe they'll kill us. God multiplied their sounds, scared the Syrians off, left their camp, left all their stuff. They ate until they were about to pop. They looked like the fullest ticks. They said, we better go back and tell everybody about what we've discovered. They go back to the, to the, to the gates of Samaria and knock on the gate. Who is it? It's the lepers. We're full. There's all kind of food right over there across the creek, more than you can possibly eat. They broke the gate down and trampled the captain of the gate, and he died there. Everyone else who believed the word of wisdom from the prophet participated in the word of wisdom, ate of the food, but the captain of the gate, he got trampled and killed. One was a prophetic word of wisdom. The other was a personal prophecy for him. You see the difference. And finally, there's discerning of spirits. This is essential for deliverance ministry. It's very helpful in all kinds of ministry, but the capacity to discern what kind of a spirit a person is struggling with is extremely important. They're the power gifts. Faith, it's a supernatural ability to combat unbelief, to believe God. It goes way beyond. It is supernatural, and, and it's just a capacity to believe the word of God. Then there is the gift of healing. And it refers to supernatural healing without human aid. Laying hands on people, bending hand kind of a thing, and seeing the miraculous work in healing. Then there's the working of miracles, supernatural ability to alter the course of a natural event. I tell people all the time, the definition of a miracle is this. God intervenes in the circumstance to alter the course of natural events. If someone is terminal and they're, and, and they're dying with cancer, we don't, we don't disregard the medical report. We don't, we don't say, oh, don't say that over him. They're giving you a diagnosis that's realistic. What we're saying is the person with a gift of healing and a gift of faith can believe in a different outcome in spite of the natural evidence. This is what a miracle is. And then there's the vocal gifts, the inspirational gifts. Tongues we've talked about extensively. It's the universal reversal of the judgment of Babel in Genesis chapter 10, where God reinstituted a common language that was beyond understanding in the human mind, but spiritually people could discern what the other person was saying. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Remember Brother Joe Rowe in his battle with cancer saying, I don't know what it is, but every morning if I start out praying in tongues, I just feel stronger and strength rising up in my body. You want to edify yourself, dedicate a portion of your devotion time to just praying in the Spirit. Just pray in the Spirit. Sing in the Spirit. Whatever. It strengthens you on the inside. And Brother Joe talks about the correct interpretation of 1 Corinthians 14.5. Can we put that up, 1 Corinthians 14.5? This is an important, uh, an important distinguish. Uh, uh, interpretation. Brother Joe has studied Greek a lot. So your interpretation says, I wish you all spoke with tongues even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Brother Joe says the correct syntax of the Greek is, I wish you all spoke in tongues in order that you might prophesy in order that you might prophesy. I said this a lot. If you won't speak in tongues, you're not going to prophesy because you have to, you have to make your mind submit to what the spirit is telling you to do. 
And sometimes when you're in Walmart and standing in line there and the Lord gives you a word for someone, you're not about to give it to them because you're filled with fear instead of faith. But when you've been practicing, when you've been praying in the spiritual language in your quiet time, when you've, been, when, you've been, when you've been breaking down that fear of operating in the spirit instead of in the flesh, and someone and you get a word for someone, you'll prophesy in a minute. Amen. He who prophesies, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. I pray that you would pray in tongues, that you would, in order that you may, prophesy. Those are the gifts. Amen? Now, you don't have to have any of them because here's the thing. You only get them as he wills, but you only get them after you pursue them. Pursue spiritual gifts. He said to pursue spiritual gifts. Who's eligible to operate in these gifts? Those that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have to have experienced the other two baptisms. Go to Hebrews chapter 6, verses, I think, 10 and 11. And it says we need to move on beyond the elementary things of the baptisms with an S, of the power of repentance, of Jesus Christ and the atonement. We need to move on past that basic stuff and let's get to the heart of the issue. There are three baptisms in the Bible. Most denominations only believe in one. But here's the three baptisms. Number one, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. You just read this. When you, I'm not going to spend time on this. I want you to just go back and check me on this. But when you're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, we're baptized by one spirit into one body. That's what it says. The only way you become a member of Jesus' church <coughs> is to have a born-again experience where you encounter the Holy Spirit and you are baptized then by the Holy Spirit into what? Into the body of Christ, into the church. You're, I don't care that you don't have a letter. I don't care that you officially not. When you have that born again experience, you have become baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Number two, there's a baptism of repentance. That's water baptism. Acts 8, 26 through 38, you read it when you have time. The eunuch is running along there in his cart, and, and Philip the evangelist said, do you understand what you're reading? He's trying to read Isaiah, and, and he says, no, I don't understand, and he explains it to him, leads him to the Lord, and there's a mud hole right there by the road, and the eunuch says, what's to prevent me from getting baptized? And he stopped the chariot, get off, and I'll baptize you right here. Water baptism is a cleansing. After you've been baptized into the body of Christ, then you need this baptism of, re of remission, of, 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 of cleansing that cleanses you from your past mistakes, and this is water baptism. Read it, Acts 8, 26 through 38. John the Baptist described that John the Baptist, who was an expert on baptism. Baptism just means to be immersed in, Okay. John the Baptist, who was an expert on baptism, says this in Matthew 3.11. I baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I cannot, are not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you into the Holy Spirit and in the fire. Who's doing the baptizing? Jesus. What's he baptizing you into? Full immersion into the Holy Spirit. What are the results? Now you're starting to become a spiritual man, a spiritual woman. Your spiritual nature is dominant. You're getting words for people that you didn't even ask for. You're sitting in a checkout line at Walmart and someone walks up to you and you know they're having a financial struggle and you can't tell. There's nothing there obvious to tell, but God says, buy their groceries. And you do it because you know in your spirit. You don't know any other way, but you know in your spirit. This is, I pray that you don't become ignorant about the spiritual man and how he functions in life. Come on. Maybe you don't embarrass that person. Maybe you wait for them in the parking lot when they come out. You say, I'd like to lay hands on you and pray for you. Because poverty is not, doesn't make you spiritual. It's cursed. I want to break that off of you. This is, what, this is what being fully immersed in the Spirit of God is. And you have to pursue it. These are progressive stages, and you've got to pursue it. I remember when I was, I've told this story, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but when I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, my God, 
My life changed. My life changed. I had an encounter with God that I not even, I didn't, I went, and so here, and here's the thing. I went to Louisiana and I didn't even know what I was after. I didn't even know. But when I got there, when that, when, when Brother Stockstill said, receive the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about something happened to me that altered my life. And now I begin to get understanding of the word and I begin to get knowledge and I begin to get words for people and I begin to, I begin to operate in a spiritual sense. I became a charismatic and I didn't even know what a charismatic was, hallelujah. It's great. God, I recommend it. But you had to pursue it. Do you have to go 860 miles? If you have that kind of, if you have that kind of desire to go someplace with Jesus that you've never been, and you go 860 miles, I will promise you the Holy Ghost will meet you when you get there. Can I get a witness out of somebody? I've heard John Hagee talk about preaching in Mexico and healing's breaking out in their meetings because it'd be raining and he'd, they'd have a little shed for him. He'd be standing up under this little shed like this and it just and it just rain and pour and it'd be just big enough for him to kind of walk around a little and water poured off the shed and it would be thousands, ten thousand, fifteen, twenty thousand people and they carry in their sick on a travoy because they got no other way or a cart or whatever and they're doing whatever they got to do to get their sick to the meeting because they got faith and believe that God will heal the, the man of God. He will use the man of God and will impart healing into the body of their loved one and this is their only hope. You know why? Because they ain't got Medicare. They haven't got an MRI machine. They don't have none of that. All they have is faith in God and a belief that if they can get to the man of God, their loved one will be healed. And he said, when you see healings begin to break out, they're out there drip, dripping and just, just the, their faith is so exponentially above ours. It's so far advanced. I'm tired of hearing about the undeveloped countries like Africa. Let me tell you what Peter Berger, Peter Berger is a sociologist at Boston University. He died a few years ago. But he has studied religion, all kind of religion, Islam, Buddhism, all of it. He studied religion and its effect on societies. And he's world-renowned. He's written books and he's an academic. All the academics love him. He's world-renowned. And in, 19, I mean, in 2013, they interviewed him. He was 80 years old. He would have died in a few couple of years. But they interviewed him, and in the interview, they asked him, they said, what has surprised you the most? What has surprised you the most about the development of religion in the modern era? And he replied, and he, was a, he calls himself an incurable Lutheran. So, so, so he is, he's a Christian, but not a spiritual Christian. And he replied, I have never, no one would have anticipated and no one expected, and no one can explain the movement of the Pentecostal Christian church through Africa, through Latin America, into Asia, coming into the youth in Europe. It has swept across continents. It has swept across continents. And there is no explanation for it. And they currently estimate there are 660 million Pentecostal Christians in these regions of the world, making it the fastest growing religious phenomenon in the history of world religion. Come on, somebody, the Holy Ghost is still alive. The same spirit that I the same spirit that was among you when I brought you out of Egypt is still with you. But you when you when you got no when you got no MRI machine, when you don't have any, you don't have any and listen, God, I tell you, I want to just say I love the doctors and nurses. My God, they're wonderful people. And they have a calling on their life. And they help us. And I'm not against that at all. But when you're in a situation where you've got no other thing to believe in except the word of Jesus and the man of God that he has sent. That's where you see them getting up out of wheelchairs. That's where you see blind eyes open. That's where you see the power 
of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit. And they don't care about your religious philosophies. They ain't got time for that. Larry Stockstill went to Africa, he and the boys, and them and Reinhard Bonnke, Brother Bonnke, he's prayed for me and Carol. What an anointing. What an anointing. And they went to Africa, and they did a big meeting there. A guy walks into Brother Larry's office in Baton Rouge, and he had, he had made a big stock deal, and he, he said, I'm, I'm bringing you this offering. What would you do if you had a million dollars? He asked Brother Larry, he said, what would you do if you had a million dollars? And he said, I would go to Africa, and I would hold a revival. And brother, the brother says, well, here you go. And he handed him a check for a million bucks. Can you believe that? He called Brother Reinhard Bonk and he said, listen, you've always wanted to do a, a revival in Nigeria. I got the money. You want to do it? Yeah, we'll do it. And they preached in Nigeria. And I've got video of this meetings where they just had, it was like repeaters. They had speakers, you know, on poles that would go out, you know, 100 yards and then another one and then another one. And it sounded like an echo. If you've ever heard Brother Bronke preach, that's why he preached. He says, and the Lord. He's used to preaching in those places with a millions of people in the reverb. And they had, they had 850,000. The Pentecostal church is sweeping across the globe. 850,000 converts in one week. Less than 50 cents a soul. You think that brother with a million dollars is doing? How do you think he's doing now? Oh, yeah, we don't want to talk about money in the church. Well, how are you going to get 850,000 Nigerians saved in one week without money? And Brother Larry said they would come up for prayer. And him and the boys are up there just ministering until he I can't stand up anymore. Crippled, blind, infested with leprosy. You name it. Bringing them to the stage. And we would no more get the prayer out of our mouths. And by the way, they didn't understand English. Come on, somebody. They didn't understand English. Brother Larry said, we'd pray in tongues or we'd pray in English. It didn't matter. The effect was the same. We would pray for somebody and they would get up out of a wheelchair. We would pray for somebody and they would be healed instantly. He said, I am ruined for preaching in America. Comes back home and they're arguing over the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Let me tell you something about Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. But he can't move through a people who are so hardened by tradition and are so worried about what somebody might think that are so impressed with themselves. He can't move through people like that. He has to move through desperate people. And I'm here to tell you, America will become desperate. We're going to see it in our lifetime. And where will they come? They'll come to you. Because you're a spiritual man. I pray that you don't be ignorant about what it is to be a spiritual man or a spiritual woman. We prayed for a healing. We prayed for a breakthrough. We prayed for a miracle. And we got one. How many of you think that's just the tip of the iceberg of what we have the capacity to manifest if we'll pursue 
with our whole life, pursue a life of learning how to tap in to the power and the presence of God. Amen. But I have a word for the charismatic church as well. We need to be careful. Or we can get religious too. If 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, if you can put that scripture up. Paul said, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Here's the thing. After this chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the rest of the chapter, the first 11 verses are about the gifts of the Spirit. The remaining amount of the chapter is about the diversity in the body of Christ about each one of us being different and unique and how important it is that we not compare ourselves with those who commend themselves who spend all their time bragging on their spiritual prowess. Come on, somebody. My spiritual experience, I had to go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to have my encounter with the Holy Ghost. You may get it right here in this sanctuary. I think many of you have. You may get it out there in a field somewhere. It doesn't quit making your experience trying to compare your experience to mine. Just have the experience. That's all that's important. I don't care how it happens, and I don't even care when it happens, and I don't need the credit for it happening. I just want you to pursue it with passion and say, God, set me on fire with your Holy Ghost. I don't want to be sitting here in America on our blessed assurances while the rest of the world is being won by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we're going, well, we can't go over there because they pray in tongues. I'm trying not to be, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm confessing to you too that I have more trouble with religious people than I do any other. And God knows the Lord has quickened me and said, you better watch it. But how can you be complacent when there is suffering and desperation in the world? And you have the answer. You have it. His name is Jesus Christ. But you can't go up and pray for people that are sick and say that, well, if God decides he wants to. You have to have faith to tap into that beacon of power that you can't see, touch, smell, or taste. It's non-physical. But you can direct it into that circumstance and you can see a miracle in somebody's life. Amen. That's what I want to be about. That's what I want to be about as a church. And I'm, uh, I'm stuck here in America because this is where God has planted me. But you know this. I would go to the jungles with David Hogan in a minute if God would open that door. I would go to Africa with Reinhard Bonnke in a heartbeat if God would open that door. But I believe that God has called us, and specifically this church and this ministry, to lead the charge to bring Christians back to the basics of total reliance, complete reliance, not on our economy, not on our job, not on our politics, not on our medical capacity, which is wonderful. The medical capacity is wonderful. How many of you know that God gave those guys revelations for most of those medical? If you study the history of science, you know what you see? It's pretty serendipitous. You know what that means? That means that if we all assume they do a, they do a experiment, they have a conclusion, they do another experiment, they keep building on their knowledge until they get a breakthrough. No, what happens is they spilled the bottle into the wrong container most of the time. And voila, they got a new drug that alleviates suffering. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not against that, but I want us to get back to the place where we're thirsty and hungry for God again. And that where we're saying, I want to be spiritual. I want to be spiritual in my nature. Yeah, I'm going to be criticized, but you know what? I don't care about that. I need the power of God 
to help build the church worse than I need to be liked by everybody. 